settled in London with her daughter and set about conquering the city with her efforts to become an interior designer. And I'm going to let Adrian talk about that. Siri's first foray into interior decoration was at the London firm Thornton Smith, which was established in 1906 by Walter George Thornton Smith. The firm was well known as an interior decorator in the 1920s and 30s. And besides Siri, also employed the famous interior decorator John Fowler. Oh, really? Mm Mm-hmm. Huh. What is he famous for? John Beresford Fowler is most known for his Chinese style wallpaper, which he painted, but then marketed as 18th century originals. But also he was accomplished in marbling and graining, so faux painting. He was involved in the redecoration of dozens of substantial country houses and townhouses, including Radbourne Hall and Grimsthorpe Castle. It's Grimsthorpe, because I was researching that recently for one of my connections to the American heiresses of the Gilded Age. So Thornton was very traditional, so maybe a little bit more throwback than Siri. Right. She was very modern. She was very modern, but Thornton Smith was well-versed in all these different sort of interior design finishes, faux graining, like you said, whatever Fowler was proficient at. He made a goal of, quote, humble elegance. He redesigned his own country house, the Hunting Lodge in Odaham in the late 40s. He says, quote, what I wanted here was something utterly unpretentious, very comfortable with the veneer of elegance and informality. Was that Thornton Smith or John Fowler? John Fowler. Okay. The the pretty Neo-Jacobean structure became, in the words of one later occupant, Fowler's own personal trianal. Anyhow, Thornton Smith. Walter Thornton Smith purchased the site of Schopenhanger's Manor, Maidenhead, (laughs) Berkshire, In 1914, and during 1914 to 18, he rebuilt the manor in 16th century style, reusing various architectural and interior decorations from a number of 16th and 17th century houses. So, architectural salvage. Right. Thornton Smith died in 1963, so fairly late, and following his loss, Schopenhanger's Manor was sold to the S.O. Petroleum Company in 1965. And they tore it down. It was converted into a hotel. (laughs) Oh, okay. Then it was demolished in 2007. Okay, (laughs) that sounds about right. And it was this beautiful, rambling Tudor creation. Oh. Perfectly charming and so English and gone. Those bastards. From Thornton Smith, Siri learned about furniture restoration, trempe l'oeil, faux finishes, and the mechanics of traditional upholstery. Her internship also included learning about the business side of the trade. It was almost an insolent gesture for a well-born British woman then. Siri got away with charging clients fairly outrageous amounts because of perceived value rather than product. She was talented and the circle of people she was influencing valued her vision and creativity more than the furniture and objects they were installing in their respective houses. Siri was able to create her own brand by establishing her level of importance, one that she clearly lived up to. Her vision was important enough for the architecture to be altered to accommodate the design. One story states that a ceiling was lowered six inches because there was not enough damask for the walls if it was any higher. Apparently, she once told a client, if you don't have $10,000, I don't want to waste my time. Well, at least she was honest. That's the kind of conviction I want to have in my life. I know, right? At 42 years young, she opened a shop called Siri Limited on Baker Street in London in 1922. Her rooms were enjoyed by the likes of Cecil Beaton, Wallace Simpson, and the Prince of Wales. Siri may have had no academic training, but her apprenticeship clearly paid off and she had certainly made it onto the scene. Additional shops opened in Chicago and New York by the close of the 1920s. According to First Dibs... The store offered an eclectic mix of Regency pieces, some taken from her own house, limed and painted furnishings, decorative rarities like rock crystal ornaments and Chinese silk paintings, French fabrics and trimmings, and avant-garde rugs by designer Marion Dorn. She had many different types of objects to install in these houses and did not just stick to one particular style or even vintage. Yeah, I just found this article in Vogue about her saying that 
She was inspired by the watercolors of Empress Eugenie and tufted Second Empire upholstery, oh. which she adapted for contemporary rooms, believing that Victorian design softened the hard lines of modernism. Well, she liked to mix for sure because she definitely used some modernist items. Right. I guess if you're looking at a building, it's sort of more about the architecture than the finish. So if you're looking at one of her rooms, I don't think your eye would go to one place because it was compositionally so well done. Like you would just see it in its entirety. You wouldn't just be drawn to one detail. You would see the whole room. Right. Yeah, that's actually a good point. If you go to Pinterest and just look her up, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll find a lot of pictures Some interior design elements that were common to her palette are still popular today across the spectrum of value. She covered books and white vellum, and book wrapping is definitely an idea I've seen in in commercial spaces, whether a hotel or a restaurant. Fur carpets. This fun item definitely saw a resurgence in Target, but only landed there after being in the pages of El Decor or Architectural Digest. Flaunting high-end floor fluff. On the floors of rich and famous people. (laughs) And who hasn't seen a lamp made of stacked spheres on the floor of home goods? The design of a graduated glass ball lamp was popularized by Siri. She also covered dining chairs with white leather, which sounds rather 80s-tastic to me, so she was clearly ahead of her time. Perhaps less popular now, but known as a Siri signature, were mirrored room screens and fireplace surrounds, fringed sleigh beds and console tables with plaster bases in the shape of palm fronds, shells, or dolphins. The latter bits definitely enjoyed a Florida resurgence, which may even continue to this day. According to First Dibs, again... After mom created a trend-setting dressing room for the residents of Helen and George Hay Wiggum in Mayfair, London, her taste was instantly admired and soon her decorative services sought. However, it wasn't until 1927 when she introduced an all-white room at a midnight party at her new townhouse on King's Road that her bold originality was fully appreciated by London's smart set. Harper's Bazaar described the room this way. White walls, white satin curtains, white flowered chairs, white lilies, and the light softened by a white velvet lampshade all give that modern feeling which in conjunction with old furniture is so attractive. By the end of the 1920s, her clients included Noel Coward, Wallace Simpson, and the Prince of Wales. Making the most of her new tastemaker status, a word that makes me pretty nauseous these days. I know, right? She opened branches of her Siri Limited shop in Chicago and New York, which I mentioned before. So she was on both sides of the pond. Briefly. Briefly. Although she was known for white rooms, her own drawing room was the only all-white room she ever did. Others were accented with color. Pale blue for a house by the sea or beige with pink satin curtains for her own house at Le Touquet, a society resort on the far northwest coast of France whose name means corner. But many rooms had surprisingly strong palettes. Cecil Beaton, the photographer, remembered leaf emerald wallpaper, magenta cushions, and chaparelli pink. So chaparelli pink is a reference to famous Italian-born but Paris-made designer Elsa Chaparelli, who reinvented knitwear in the 20s. And my love of fashion, and I guess fashion history, was why I sort of took this turn off of the... (laughs) The main research, because I had heard Chaparelli's name, of course, but didn't really know what it was that made her famous. Chaparelli in the 1920s created a hand-knit pullover with a trompe l'oeil bow. So this means that it, in architecture, trompe l'oeil is something that's painted on the wall or the ceiling. It's a scene that looks like something else. So you'll have a trellis with the garden scene on a wall and it, it will look like a painting. It's sort of realism, right? And on the ceiling, there'll be a sky with cherubs and clouds. It's and fake. It's fake. Trump Loy, I think, is literally fool of the eye. Loy is I. Yeah. Faking, fake faking the eye. the eye or fooling the eye. Anyhow, so. If you actually Google her, it, they have her. She's still like. Chaparelli. Yeah, they oh, still yeah. like have the house of Chaparelli. Yes, there still is. Correct. And they have a picture of this. 
It's lovely. Yeah. It's a so it's this knit top. It's black and white. So it's a trempe because the bow is knitted into the collar, but it is it's so it's not a separate material. It is the knit and it's just knitted to look like a bow. The model wearing it looks incredibly depressed. I think that's her. Really? Well, one of, if you're if you're on the Shaparelli website, I think a lot of those pictures are her. So Vogue deemed this pullover a masterpiece, yeah. and it became so famous so quickly that it was sometimes ri- written up in fashion magazines without the creator's name. Although Ceres was not a fashion designer, of course, she would have followed trends of color and texture and certainly taken cues from other aesthetically influential people. Mom's days were double speed. She worked from her bed in the morning, dictating to her secretary at a desk in the bedroom. And she dictated to her shop manager in the car on the way home at night. Staff rarely stayed long, not surprisingly. And as we know, her marriages did not last. Well, they lasted. They just didn't live together. Sure. It's kind of a weird marriage. Yes. Maybe it's the perfect marriage. So her daughter, Liza, was married in 1936. And the London house mom decorated for her was among her best work. After finishing it, she sold her own house and traveled to India with Elsie DeWolf, quote, to paint the black hole of Calcutta white. (laughs) (laughs) Mom carried on working, but her best years were behind her. And more about her friend. Elsie. Elsie DeWolf. Her frenemy. Her frenemy, because keep your enemies close and your frenemies closer. Right. Elsie was a New Yorker and actually got her start before Siri. She decided in 1905 to become a professional decorator, issuing smart business cards embellished with her trademark wolf with nosegay crest. That same year, a group of New York women named Astor, Harriman, Morgan, Whitney, and Marbury organized the city's first club exclusively for women, the Colony Club. Its handsome headquarters at Madison and 31st Street were designed by Stanford White, (laughs) who, along with Marbury and other friends on the board, got DeWolf the commission to do the decoration. When the colony opened in 1907, the interiors established her reputation overnight. Instead of imitating the heavy atmosphere of men's clubs, DeWolf introduced a casual, feminine style with an abundance of glazed chintz, immediately making her the chintz lady. (laughs) Tiled floors, light draperies, pale walls, wicker chairs, clever vanity tables, and the first of her many trellised rooms. The astonished reaction of members to her illusionistic indoor garden pavilion put DeWolf's name on many lips and led to a number of lucrative missions across the country. Siri Mom had come to be called the White Queen. And another of her famous rooms was an all-white party room for none other than her daughter. The room featured a parchment screen to hide a black piano, a chagrin coffee table, that's eel skin, both by Jean-Michel Frank, who is a minimalist French interior designer. Mom was one of the first English decorators to champion his work and decorative vision. Two tailored velvet cream sofas with elaborate fringe, which would become a mom signature, a fireplace with mirror surround and mirror baseboards would round out the scene. There was even more dazzling to be done in this room. A tall folding screen of narrow mirrored panes set in chrome-plated frames was set up in a corner. The room was roundly deemed the epitome of modern glamour. And it actually sounds very deco to me. But again, very soft sofas, because she believed in comfort. And the fringe sort of adds a little bit of whimsy. But also mirror. Like the the room, the picture of this room is pretty cool, because it's still somewhere that you'd want to sit. Right. There's a pretty iconic photo that Mm -hmm. Cecil Beaton took of his sister, Baba. She's looking all Jean Harlow in front of this yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. It's, it really is. I mean, it's definition total twenties or thir- thirties. Yeah, mm-hmm. total definition of Art Deco. Yep. How the style translated in America may be seen in the pale master bedroom Mom produced for socialite Celia Tobin Clark's San Francisco mansion in 1931. Celia Tobin Clark was the wife of Charles W. Clark, whom she married in 1904. He is the half brother of Hugh Jack Clark who some of you might recognize if you've ever read the book Empty Mansions, which Caroline just finished and I read a few years ago, and it's amazing. And it's coming soon to a Scandal Sheets episode near you. It is. (laughs) 
Inspired by 18th century decor, the room is entirely white except for the walls, which mom covered in white linen, stenciled with a green scroll pattern adapted from an 18th century Swedish leather wall covering. So she takes inspiration from lots of different types of interior decor and locations. 